I, I uh, need to make uh, a couple of sort of uh, background uh, philosophical points that are really important to what I want to get to, which is the prophetic stance of uh, Christians uh, in the world. Uh, the first one, is, and we are going to look at some texts. Uh, the first one is a um, philosophical uh, point. I hope you heard uh, Shane Hughes' sterling lecture this morning. Absolutely superb sermon. And he kind of dropped this line in there about postmodern epistemology. And I'm just going to talk about that for a few minutes because it is the world in which I live. But I'm going to do it in ways that are going to be highly accessible to you, and you are going to immediately agree with my assessment. (laughs) Uh, At least those of you who are uh, spiritual will. That's what, that's what Paul does all the time, right? You know, you can disagree with me, but spiritual people will see that I'm, uh, that I'm right. Um, now, it's really a pretty simple point, and it's this. There is always a gap in the story we tell about things and the things as they really happen. Okay, now... Any of you who have ever been in the position of doing, for instance, marriage counseling, know that. You have two people who are describing exactly the same experience, but their description of that experience can be vastly different. Now, the easy way of addressing things like that is to say that uh, people uh, uh, lie. Okay, now, I, I have no interest in contesting that, that, that truth, uh, but that's way too simple for this experience. Uh, people's perception of the reality and the reality are just different. And another way of saying that is it is impossible for us to get a God's eye view of things. What I know, I know as a knowing subject. I don't know them as God knows. And I bring all sorts of background into the way that I interpret the world. Now, this leads to uh, the following uh, very important four words. I might be wrong. And, um, you know, as long as I'm talking about Christian stances uh, during, a, uh, during an election year, uh, one of the unfortunate things about politics as it has evolved is it has become impossible for politicians to be critical of their own position, which is very unfortunate. Uh, and this is going to be really important to the case uh, that I'm going to make uh, because As I call Christians to a prophetic stance, there always has to be this background that in the stance that I'm taking, I might be wrong. And the question is, is it possible to take a prophetic stance and still have what I would call epistemological humility? I might be wrong. Okay, that's sort of uh, background uh, number one. Uh, Now, I thought it was. Um, I try really hard, although not always successfully, not to get cynical about that. Uh, Because it's it's very easy uh, to sort of get cynical because of our inability to ever perceive the world uh, exactly as it is. And you can kind of throw up your hands and say, oh, nobody can know anything uh, for sure. And that's not really the stance I want to occupy. Uh, what, the stance I want to occupy is a self-critical one. Um, now, uh, I find it uh, relatively easy to uh, see through other people's point of views uh, because my eyes face that way. Okay. Uh, it is far more difficult Uh, to turn that critical eye on myself. And, um, you know, uh, uh, people always uh, sort of wonder when you're in a sort of public profession like mine, and especially when you're a theologian, uh, how do you feel when you get pushback? 
And the answer is, great. Uh, because I'm not getting any pushback. You're not listening to me. And one of the things uh, we do is we clarify and help and correct and discipline each other's thinkings by those kind of discussions. Now, there's a kind of pushback that is unpleasant and that I don't pay much attention to. Uh, but uh, on, on most topics, uh, it is possible for reasonable people not to see them in exactly the same way, and I need to see them through somebody else's eyes. We sometimes describe this as sympathetic imagination. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why I, I have a burn for the importance of diversity in the church because if we're only looking from one perspective, we have no idea what we're missing. And uh, that's why, I, I, um, you know, I, I've said for years, I spend very little time reading commentaries written from a point of view that I hold. I already hold my prejudices very deeply. I really don't need them reinforced. I spend most of my time reading stuff from points of view that I do not particularly agree with because they're asking questions I'm not asking. They've turned the camera angle in a way uh, that I haven't, and I'm able to see something. It's not like I always think uh, they're right. I usually don't. But sometimes I, can't, I don't even know to ask the question that they're asking. Okay, that's, that, now that is background number one. Uh, number two, I, I have gotten uh, several questions uh, after last night and after yesterday's uh, class, excellent questions. Uh, and uh, I, I had sort of put off to the last day talking about this, and it's clear I should have talked about it earlier uh, now, but uh, that's now uh, impossible. Uh, 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 time being what it is. Uh, what I have been trying to describe is what I think uh, that the stance of Christians and the church should be in an election year or basically any time. There's this other thing that I really haven't talked about, and I'm not really going to talk about today, but I have to gesture uh, towards it, that for lack of a better term, I'm going to describe as statecraft. Uh, that is, it seems to me that the state has certain obligations that it must engage as the state. Uh, now, uh, I uh, uh, kind of uh, said on the first day, uh, I have a great uh, mistrust for power, and I do. But the state has to exercise some power. They just have to. Uh, and uh, while that makes it difficult for me to function as a functionary of the state, uh, it is no accident that I'm not your president. <laughs> um, um, I, 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 I'm perfectly willing to recognize the state has, having to exercise statecraft. Uh, for those of you, again, who are sort of theological wonks, uh, let me uh, refer you to Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, Niebuhr was a very influential uh, uh, theologian of the mid-20th uh, century. He once appeared on Time magazine. The list of theologians who've done that is very short. Uh, he was very influential in public policy. He, in fact, had enormous influence on uh, President uh, Obama. And uh, Niebuhr also had significant influence on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer studied with Niebuhr at uh, Union Seminary when he was in America uh, for a year. And uh, at one point, uh, Niebuhr was a uh, pacifist. But uh, World War II made him get over that. And it's really interesting to kind of watch him thinking uh, through it. And his basic position is sometimes the powers of darkness is such a threat that the children of light must take up arms against it. And that's all in response to the Hitler stuff. And what kind of emerges out of that is what is often described as Christian realism. Okay, so in, uh, in my relationships with you, insofar as we have a personal relationship, we can aspire towards love. 
But when it comes to governments and, in fact, collectives of any kind, they are, from Niebuhr's point of view, incapable of love. The best you can hope for from them is justice. And justice comes not because people aspire to justice. Justice comes from the balancing of power. Uh, that is, uh, you know, if I've got some power and you've got some power in that interchange, then justice emerges, although love doesn't. Now, I'm not particularly trying to sell you uh, on Niebuhr, although uh, I've probably been more influenced uh, by him than I should. Uh, the students in here who've taken theology with me know that I spend a great deal of time analyzing Niebuhr's um, uh, theories of uh, human nature, uh, which I do by almost in their entirety. What I'm saying here is I'm not talking about how the state ought to function, nor was I talking about it last night. Uh, I will leave that an open question for the moment, and I will also leave as an open question how Christians who are in the government should function as Christians in the government. It's not that I don't think that's an interesting question, it's just that's not the fish I'm frying today. And uh, if, if you're really interested in that, maybe you could uh, come and pay lots of money and take my ethics class, and we'll talk about it. <laughs> um, Okay, what, what, what I want to think about okay, is, is how does the church or Christians, what, what kind of stance do we take uh, in the world where the state is being the state and uh, in a world where there is always a gap between our perception of the world and the world as it is? How am I doing? Is all that yes. re rel relatively clear? Um, Okay, uh, so let me uh, see what I'm after here. Um, so I, I want to argue for uh, a stance that grows out of the Hebrew prophet's imagination. And I'm going to do it in two words. Uh, justice and mercy. And uh, I want to argue that, that Christians and the church need to occupy the stance of always appealing for greater justice because there's never perfect justice in the state and greater mercy because that's the gospel. And I'm going to do it without, without occupying a uh, strictly uh, Lutheran stance. Let me very quickly do uh, Luther uh, on the state. Apologize for the church history lecture. That's probably not what you signed up for. But um, uh, everybody knows Luther is this, is this great uh, uh, theologian of grace. Uh, Luther talks about grace more uh, compellingly than any Christian since Paul, in my opinion. Uh, and you've got to be a bit of a rock not to be moved by the way he talks about, uh, talks about grace. And one of the reasons why he has such a powerful view of grace is because he has such an abominably low view of human nature. Uh, in terms of human nature, Luther makes Calvin look like an optimist. Um, you know, there are many thinkers in, in Christian faith who think the image of God has been effaced by the fall. Luther believes it has been obliterated. Um, and so, if salvation is going to happen, it has to happen by grace. Because we are such miserable sinners. And so, in our relationships as Christians, they are basically under... Uh, what we might call the, the, the eon, the umbrella of grace. Uh, however, you may have noticed that not everybody in the world is a Christian. And so when it comes to the state, Luther says, this is not about grace, this is about law. And what the state ought to do when somebody breaks the law is lower the boom on them. Which says, if you were a magistrate and, and the you know, boy behind the, uh, lives behind your house broke in and was stealing your lawnmower, and, or in my case, was looking for the lawnmower that doesn't <laughs> exist. Uh, 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 <clears throat> and uh, I, 
catch him. And I say, oh, what are you doing? He says, I'm sorry. And he, I, okay, I forgive you. But if that same kid is brought, for, brought before me in court as a magistrate, then I'm going to throw the book at him. There's a basic dualism there. Everybody with me still? Okay, now I'm not entirely comfortable with that. Uh, I'm not entirely uncomfortable with it. Another way of saying it would be, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount, and, uh, you know, loving your enemies is excellent personal relations, but it is highly questionable foreign policy. Okay, and uh, Luther sort of, sort of gets that. Um, and I'm not going to go at it uh, quite that way, but uh, again, you, you probably need to see that because it may be lurking around somewhere in the background. Uh, let's uh, listen to some scripture, okay? Uh, how about uh, Isaiah 58? Uh, just as an example, you can almost drop your Bible open into the Hebrew prophets and find uh, something uh, like this. Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen only for a day to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry, and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. By the way, does that sound familiar at all? That sounds shockingly like Matthew 25, doesn't it? Then your light will, dawn, uh, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer, you will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. Um, Okay, uh, these passages always have a context, and that one does too. Uh, but the theme is sort of startling. Uh, fasting is a pretty serious expression of devotion, right? Uh, I mean, it's so serious, most of us have given it up for ever. Uh, <laughs> I had a student once, you know, I, was, I was trying to teach him some spiritual disciplines, and, and one of the things I was trying to teach him is it's, it's, it's an experiment. You, you kind of put yourself into the disciplines and you learn which ones are the ones through which God works on you. And so uh, he says, well, I experimented with fasting, and uh, after a couple of hours I decided that one wasn't for me. Uh, <laughs> Well, I appreciate you taking it for a test drive. And, uh, <laughs> um, and the prophet says that, that even this extreme devotion to God doesn't count much with God apart from a passionate concern for justice. I'm worried about your workers who are oppressed. I'm worried about those who are hungry and those who don't 
have clothes to wear. Uh, and I'm sort of taking it as axiomatic that if God cares about it, I ought to care about it. Um, and in every society, justice is a, uh, a constant problem. It was a problem in Israel. Uh, okay, now I'm going I'm to very rapidly uh, take you through um, an Old Testament story. And again, a lot of you are Bible study wonks and you'll know this story. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm just not going to take uh, the time uh, to read it because I'm on a schedule here. Uh, I, I guess I could test the waters. Uh, how many of you know the story of Naboth's vineyard? Okay, most of you do. Uh, poor Naboth, he's got a vineyard. Wicked King Ahab wants it. Looks outside. Hey, that one's near my palace. I want that. He goes and offers a good business deal. Naboth says, I'll buy that, uh, I'll buy that uh, vineyard uh, off of you. And Naboth says, nah, it's really all I've got. It's my family uh, heritage. And uh, Ahab, uh, he, he won't sell it to Ahab, the king of Israel. So uh, Ahab goes to the palace and uh, pouts. Turns his face to the wall and won't eat. A royal pout. There's no pout like a royal pout. Uh, Queen Jezebel comes in. And in a rough translation of the Hebrew, says, what's the matter, big boy? <laughs> and he says something like, I want Naboth's vineyard. He won't sell it to me, and I'm pouting. And she says, aren't you the king of Israel? You see, Jezebel is a foreigner. And she doesn't get this. What is the point of being king or queen if you can't have anything you want? And Naboth, um, uh, you know, he's, he's just kind of fodder for the, for the mill here. And Ahab, who's nobody's idea of a nice guy, it doesn't occur to him to just take it because even as wicked as Ahab is, he knows the basic understanding in Israel is the king lives under the covenant too. I mean, this was the original problem with monarchy in Israel. How can Israel have a king when Israel already has a king? There's actually a kind of lively debate that goes on in the text about that. Uh, and so, you know, as you recall, Jezebel goes through this uh, thing to have uh, Naboth killed and, and take the vineyard, and, uh, uh, and finally Ahab gets killed. Okay, that's the end of the story. Uh, uh, but I, I think this, this tension is interesting. And you see lots of passages uh, in the Hebrew prophets and in the Old Testament that insist that the poor have to get a fair day in court too. Guess what? That is not a 21st century problem. That's a persistent problem. Justice is always a problem. Always has been. Um, and I'm going to argue the case that it is the church's job, the Christian's job, to keep advocating justice for those who are the least likely to get it. That's what we do. Uh, and uh, we are uh, engaged in the world. Um, it, it, it really is important that, that you hear this uh, because of what I said about being a Lipscombite on uh, the first day. Uh, the fact that I do not choose to uh, be involved in politics or vote for major party candidates, unless you count the Jesus party as major, uh, doesn't mean I'm disengaged from the world. There are hungry people to be fed. Uh, there are people who are in need of justice. And I also uh, want to argue the case that uh, while the church can be engaged in relief in these areas, it is also perfectly within the purview of the change to work for structural change. In other words, churches don't get just to bail water out of the boat. It would be okay if every once in a while they would seal in a leak. 
It just makes good sense. Um, and the church isn't always going to get that right, by the way. We, we might be wrong. Uh, but we, we are, we are uh, persistent uh, in saying that the values of the God we serve and the kingdom of God says everybody has got to be treated fairly. God cares about that. We care about that. Um, and by the way, the notion that, um, that politics is the only way to address that is just short-sighted. Okay, there is a way to address that uh, in politics. I happen to admire some who do. Uh, but the church has always got to be uh, speaking a word of uh, justice. And the other side of that is uh, the church is persistently a word of mercy. Uh, because uh, the whole world constantly stands in sin. Um, I'm, I'm going to read a really uh, bizarre uh, passage uh, to you now, and I'm not going to fully interpret it, uh, not because I don't have time, but because I can't. <laughs> uh, time is not the least of my problems in this passage. Um, I understand Professor Wright maybe took a pass at this at some point uh, this week. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, where you have this problem of this guy who's sleeping with his stepmother and somehow the church is, is proud of being such a broad-minded place, apparently. Um, I, I'm not going to try to sort all that out and who you should have fellowship and who you shouldn't and, and sexual ethics. Again, it's not that I don't think that's important, but um, you're going to have to pay a lot more uh, tuition if you, if you want to hear a discussion of that. Um, I want to look at 5.9, kind of where this kind of comes out uh, for Paul. Uh, I have written you in my letter. That apparently was a previous letter that he sent to them. I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, greedy, or idolater, or slanderer, or drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. And then this curious passage. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Well, I don't know if I agree with that or not. Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Now that's one of those, uh, the Bible is an endlessly interesting book. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you know, that, that's one you just have to kind of sit with for a while. And I'm still not sure I've got my, my arms all the way around it. Um, but it seems to me, uh, notice how with that phrase I refer back to my first point that there's a gap between how things are and my perception of them. Uh, it seems to me that there is a backhanded generosity in this passage. Uh, the whole world is in sin. Uh, and I can't fix it. Um, the world's too big for me to, to fix. Uh, and we're all so, so stuck in sin. Uh, I do have special responsibility within the church for the kingdom of God, which is a smaller circle. Uh, another way of saying this is... Um, I've, I've tried to make this point when I teach the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, getting people to live a deeply cruciform ethic who are not followers of Jesus Christ seems to be a more or less losing proposition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't be ethical. They often are. Uh, it does mean that the ethic involved in following Jesus, first of all, involves following Jesus. 
And when you call Jesus Lord and Master, then a whole new uh, uh, set of responsibilities uh, comes on you. Uh, another way of saying it is, uh, I don't, if I decide to be a follower of Jesus, I don't get to be a picker and chooser in terms of what Jesus teaches. I'm sort of buying in. And, you know, we've been having these gatherings long enough that, that you know one of the things I push my students on is, what is it that Jesus says that you don't like? And if you can't put anything there, you aren't listening nearly closely enough. Uh, because Jesus says some mighty disagreeable things. Uh, well, if I just take the Sermon on the Mount, if anybody slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You like that? It's a dumb idea. <laughs> How many times should I forgive those who sin against me? Seven times? No. Seventy-seven times. That's an even dumber idea. <laughs> You're in my class. You won't get seven. Uh, um, we'll, we'll have a come to Jesus meeting way before we get to seven. Uh, um, and that's, that there's a sense in which I cannot judge the world for not living in to the ethic of a crucified Savior when they don't believe in a crucified Savior. There's actually a kind of generosity to that. Uh, there is an enormous need for mercy in the world. Uh, and that in itself is a hard teaching. Um, and I, I, I struggle with this, with my 18 to 22-year-olds. Uh, when I'm teaching them philosophy, one of the things that, one of the people we study is Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, he's a kooky, French, atheist, existentialist, sort of communist, but he got over it. Uh, uh, um, and one of the things I admire about Sartre uh, is he thinks that you have to take absolute responsibility for every decision that you make. Uh, so, you know, the day we're st studying Sartre at the end of the quiz over the Sartre reading, I say, okay, according to Sartre, I want you to answer the following question. If you were on time for class today, or if you were late for class today, why was that? And the only answer that's correct is, that's what I chose to do. Um, and that's important with my 18 to 22 year olds because they like to make bad choices and then make them my responsibility. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm teaching an 8 o'clock class, I give a quiz the first few minutes of every class, I have one student who always comes in after the quiz, so they're flunking the class. They eventually come to my office when they realize they're in trouble. This is usually the last week of class. <laughs> but let's imagine it's much earlier. <laughs> Mr. Harris? I'm failing your class. I've noticed. It's because I keep missing the quizzes. Yeah, I see that. Tell me about it. Well, I'm having to work 30 hours a week. I'm taking 18 academic hours. I just can't get up and get there at 8 o'clock. I said, whoa. You're working 30 hours a week and you're taking 18 hours? That sounds really hard. Why don't you drop my class? Well, I can't drop your class. I got to have the credit. Quit working so many hours. I can't. I got to have the money. You have a car? Yeah, sell it. <laughs> Uh, 
I gotta have my car. This is not my problem. <laughs> you make whatever choice you want to, and I will show nothing but respect for it, but this choice is entirely on you. This is not my problem. Or, Mr. Harris, I have this chance to go on this mission trip to Haiti. Great, I think you ought to go. But I'm going to miss a couple of days of your class. Okay, you're allowed to do that. But I've already missed the maximum number of absences. <laughs> okay. Can I go? Sure. You won't lower my grade? Yeah, I'm going to lower your grade. <laughs> I can't have you lower my grade. Then don't go. <laughs> but the children in Haiti, then go. <laughs> In a hundred years, nobody is going to care what grade you made in my class. I don't care much now. <laughs> and whatever you decide to do, I will respect, but this is not my problem. Okay. You get that, right? Um, okay. We're most of us a little older. And... We know people make bad choices. And we know Sartre's not quite right. We know he's not quite right. It's not quite that simple. People make the choices they make for a variety of reasons. And I don't want to take away anything to do with personal responsibility. We need more of that, not less. But the world is going to need enormous mercy. And the church must be the place that speaks the word of mercy. Uh, and I got to tell you, we're going to have to do it pretty indiscriminately. And uh, therein lies the kind of the importance of what I said at, at, at the beginning. Uh, we tend to be hardest on the sins that aren't particularly afflicting us at the moment. And mercy comes from realizing that Luther is right in a sense. And we are all dead in sin and desperately in need of the grace of God. Now, if I was over here talking about statecraft, uh, I wouldn't presume to tell judges what sentences they ought to impose. It's a different kind of question. But if I'm over here standing in the church of God, I want to show unusual mercy and compassion to the world. I want to insist on justice. I want to keep speaking the word of mercy because I think that's what the church does. Now, I want to come back to the 1 Corinthians passage just a moment. He says... Um, you judge the church. You judge the inside. And uh, I will freely admit I'm getting ready to put my own postmodern spin on that. Okay, you're forewarned, so you can put your hand on your wallet if it makes you nervous. Uh, the church must not only take a prophetic stance towards the world, the church must take a prophetic stance towards the church. It is absolutely crucial that the church be constantly turning the critical eye to itself because we might be wrong. Now, if you know any church history at all, <laughs> uh, you know that the church has occupied positions that it later regretted. And uh, we think that would never happen to us, but if we knew what positions we were later going to regret, we wouldn't hold them at the moment. Uh, that is called the um, epistemological priority of the future. That is, somewhere in the future, all of that will become clearer. Um, and so there has to be this kind of constant uh, the word I, I use with my students is self-subversion. When I get extraordinarily nervous is when Christians take the prophetic stance towards justice and mercy but are not constantly vigilant 
to look back on themselves and see what it is that they're missing. Uh, The church, too, is in desperate need of the gracious intervention of God. And uh, as you know, I'm three days on an election year. I've said virtually nothing about politics and am apolitical, uh, mostly apolitical myself. Um, uh, not only do I not trust uh, preachers who are sure they're right about everything, uh, I certainly don't trust theologians who think they're right about everything. Uh, scientists are actually very upfront that they aren't right about everything. Um, I don't trust politicians who think they're right about everything. And no politician, uh, no preacher, no church office speaks for God. Uh, And we have to be sort of constantly vigilant about self-subverting so that we don't wind up uh, in positions that we will find uh, appalling. Uh, I will just uh, say this uh, in closing. Uh, Theologians and philosophers seem to be uh, very susceptible uh, to totalitarianism, both on the left and the right. Uh, Preachers are pretty vulnerable uh, to that. Uh, Mystics aren't very vulnerable at all. It's really interesting. The people who are least likely to be, um, to be led along and enticed and lured are the people of the desert, the people of prayer. Because in the crucible of silence and prayer, uh, arrogance and certainty cannot survive. What you constantly find out is You are a sinner, and God loves you just the way you are. And the church needs to be deeply embedded in contemplation and prayer. Uh, My colleague uh, Jerry Taylor has has done enormously wonderful work in uh, the last couple of years on racial reconciliation, Uh, and it's very hard work. And of all the things uh, I admire about uh, Dr. Taylor, the thing I admire most is this. He is, first of all, a contemplative. The work he does comes out of a deep life of prayer. Because he does not, he intends to be a word of justice and mercy in the world, but he does not intend to live his life angry. Uh, And that's possible. It's possible to passionately work for justice and mercy in the world and not be angry. And to be constantly raising questions about our own lives and positions because they're always somewhat short of the kingdom of God. At least that's what I think today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.